So we're going to switch gear and talk about brain tumor, but also brain tumor mimicking lesions. And I really want you to take home this message that not huge masses in the brain equals brain tumor. So before you go out there in the real practice, start recommending surgery for a presumed brain tumor, always think about the possibility that what you're looking at might not be brain tumor at all. So overview is I'm going to be focusing on brain tumors, the imaging aspects of it, but I'm going to spend some time discussing the tumor mimicking lesions and also discuss some of the rare types so that you have sort of a variety of the whole spectrum of brain tumor imaging. And I'm going to discuss these cases at the end, but it's, I looked at the syllabus and they actually came out uh, pretty clear. So I think I'm going to go through pretty uh, quickly of these five cases. This is a young man presenting with worsening severe headache and seizure. This is a T2 weighted imaging. This is a T1 pre-contrast imaging. This is our sagittal localizer and a T1 weighted sagittal imaging. So that was case one. This is case two, a 45-year-old woman with headache. Here are three sets of axials and a coronal post imaging. Case three, 51-year-old man with seizure. Same patient, flare imaging. Fourth patient is patient presenting with a left frontal mass. Here is diffusion and ADC map. Now, next three cases, these are patients in the age between 20 to 40. They all have same diagnoses and all presented with headaches and some sensory changes. Here's patient one. Here's patient two. Here's patient three. They all have same histopathologic diagnosis. Okay, so let's get right to it. This is the only single clinical slides that I have. Just remember, if an adult patient presents to the ER and the ER physician tells you a patient is presenting with seizure, please do not think of stroke as your number one diagnosis. Patients with stroke very rarely present with seizure. So when you hear adult with seizure, think about a space occupying mass or other lesions that could cause to uh, seizures in adults such as vascular malformation or other systemic causes. But you should never think of stroke as your number one diagnosis when patient clearly presents with a documented seizure disorder because only about less than 3%, maybe fewer, I could confirm that with Max, but very rarely acute stroke patients will present with seizure. So seizure is a very bad sign in adults. If they pre uh, present with seizure, think about a brain tumor. Histologic subtypes. So the WHO, World Health Organization, comes up with every 10 years or so with different histological subtype. And the latest version, I believe, included about 272 different types of histopathologic brain tumors. So obviously, we're dealing with an incredibly heterogeneous type of tumors. But suffice to say, on an everyday practice, you're really going to be running into three or four types. And they are the primary tumors arising from the brain parenchyma, the so-called the glioma. The next most common will be the primary tumors that are arising from the brain covering, the most common type being the meningioma. The primary neuronal tumors are actually very rare because in the brain, glial cells predominate whereas neuronal cells are a distinct minority. But in reality, you're going to be also seeing quite a bit of secondary meta um, tumors, metastases, just because systemic cancer is so much more common than any other primary brain tumors. So when you see a mass in the brain and you're suspecting brain tumor, what are the questions you're going to ask? And here are some of the questions. Where is it? How big is it? This is a very important question. Is there more than one? Because if there are more than one, your differential diagnosis is completely different. So always look for a second lesion, because then you're talking about metastases, multiple abscesses, multiple demyelinating lesions, or multiple strokes, not pri probably a primary tumor. Also look for tumor-related complication or mass-related complications, such as hydro, 
hemorrhage and herniation. Because you may have to call your neurosurgical colleague right away if somebody's about to herniate. Before you give 20 different histopathologic differential diagnoses of a mass, that's probably not the best thing to do for that patient. So always look for tumor-related complication. And I really want to stress this point one more time. Always, always in the back of your mind, ask this question. Could it be something other than brain tumor, such as demyelinating lesion, subacute stroke, subacute hematoma, infection? Very, very important. So brain tumor imaging, what do we normally use? Well, CT is still the first line of defense when patient presents with, for example, seizure in the emergency room. But I do not recommend CT as the gold standard to characterize brain tumor, just because MR is so much better. And here's, I listed in your syllabus of the sort of a typical uh, protocol that we use at uh, UCSF. But I just want to focus, when you look at CT, look for three H's, hydrocephalus, hemorrhage, and herniation. CT is incredibly good for these three. Here's a child presenting with a large mass in the posterior fossa, transependymal CSF. So you already know this patient's got a mass and a hydrocephalus. Here's another patient presenting with a, this happens to be a renal cell metastasis, presenting with a hemorrhagic mass. Here's a patient with a lymphoma that's herniating downward. So before you start giving differential of this mass, you're picking up the phone and calling the ER guys or neurosurgeries, letting them know this patient is herniating, okay, so that they could do something about it while you give contrast to work out this tumor better. Same thing. Here's a patient I just showed you of a hemorrhagic metastasis, but this could be a hemorrhagic mass from a trauma or underlying vascular malformation. There will be a whole host of other causes, but it is very important to let your referring clinician know that there is a hemorrhagic mass so that they, for example, this patient may have been in Coumadin or whatnot, so that they could alter their clinical management. This is a child with obstructive hydrocephalus, and here's that patient who is herniating with a large intraparenchymal lymphoma. This slide, I think, brings home the point that CT should not be your gold standard to image brain tumor. Here's a gentleman who presented to UCSF Medical um, e ER with a seizure. Here's a CT done, and I think everybody in this audience probably could see that there is abnormality, asymmetric high density in the left temporal lobe. But you really cannot do much with this. You could say, well, it could be, there could be some hemorrhage that's resolving, maybe there's a mass, maybe not. Here's an MRI that was done eight hours later. Clearly demonstrating a necrotic mass with a subependymal abnormal enhancement, flare imaging showing you extensive infiltrative tumor. This is glioblastoma multiforme. CT will never be able to show you this extent even with iodinated contrast, particularly this non-enhancing infiltrative disease, CT underestimates it. So just remember that. Another thing that I would like you to remember is that contrast enhancement, before you decide something is enhancing, make sure you look at pre-GAD imaging. So here is a child who came to us with a presumed diagnosis pilocytic. Here's a post-GAD imaging, looks like a typical supracellar, homogeneously enhancing mass. But here is a pre-GAD imaging, here's a post-GAD imaging. This is actually a craniopharyngioma containing a proteinaceous fluid. Never, ever, ever evaluate post-GAD imaging alone without the knowledge of pre-GAD imaging. Imaging characteristics of a tumor can help you narrow the differential diagnosis. For example, if you see a mass that is homogeneously well-defined mass like this, you're most likely dealing with an extra axial tumor, most commonly meningioma. Look at the T2 signal characteristic of a mass. If the mass is not as bright as CSF, most likely you're dealing with a more cellular type of tumor. This happens to be a atrial intraventricular meningioma, but we've seen this with uh, PNET, the primitive neuroectodermal tumors, or lymphoma, so any kind of cellular tumors can have this appearance. When you see an imaging characteristic that has combination of a cyst and a nodule, with very minimal surrounding edema, there's only really three or four things that should run into your mind, pilocytic astrocytoma being the most common. But ganglioglioma, 
Pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma, and if this was in the posterior fossa, I would even also put in hemangioblastoma. Non-contrast T1-weighted imaging showing you a bright T1 mass. This is a hemorrhagic metastasis, but this could be a lipid-containing mass. Just remember, CT is the best test of choice to look for calcification. I'm going to show you an example later how MR can completely underestimate CT uh, calcification. So if you want to confirm the presence of calcium, CT is the way to go. When you see a mass that has thick rind of enhancement with central necrosis, you're dealing with a very malignant tumor. This happens to be glioblastoma. When you see multiple lesions, think metastases, think multiple emboli or abscesses or uh, demyelinating disease. The reason why it's very difficult to sometimes narrow down. Here's an example. Here are five different patients with five different diagnoses. But if you look at their post-GAD imaging, it's actually fairly similar descriptive in the sense that they all have central necrosis surrounded by a rim of enhancement. This is a patient with glioblastoma. This is a patient with abscess. This is a patient with tuberculosis. This is a patient with demyelinating lesion. And here's a patient with radiation necrosis. So I'm going to show you some strategies to narrow down so that you do not send patients such as demyelinating lesion or radiation necrosis to surgery, whereas glioblastoma and acute infectious abscess, these are patients who should go to the OR and get their problem handled. This is a busy slide. The reason I put this in here is I think you could read it in your syllabus if you turn the light on, but nonetheless, I just give you a sort of a pie chart of how to go about what kind of imaging to look at when you're dealing with a brain mass. But the two points that I want you to take away from this particular pie, uh, this flow chart is that evaluating pre and post contrast T1 weighted imaging is the most important thing you should be doing when you're facing with a brain mass. Next, you evaluate with flare, obviously, to see how much of that is edema or infiltrative component. But the next Imaging sequence that you should be looking at is diffusion-weighted imaging. It's a very powerful technique that's going to help you narrow down the differential tremendously. So pre and post GAT T1 plus flare imaging to make your initial assessment. Next in line is diffusion-weighted imaging. So let's show you some examples of the most common types of brain tumors. So glioblastoma multiforme, unfortunately, is the most common, and it happens to be the most aggressive, and very, very uh, malignant. As the name suggests, their glioblastoma can basically look like anything. This is the most classic appearance, rim enhancement, central necrosis. But this is also glioblastoma, well circumscribed. We thought this was initially a meningioma. I mean, sometimes it could be that difficult. Here's a non-enhancing glioblastoma. Usually glioblastomas enhance, but in my experience, about 1% or so may not enhance at all. So not necessarily enhancement is going to be 100% correct. The less malignant version of the glioblastoma is the fibrillary astrocytomas. And these look like this, typically on imaging, on a post-GAT T1 imaging. Grade 2, the so-called low-grade gliomas, usually do not enhance. Grade 3, so-called anaplastic astrocytomas, tend to enhance, but not as avidly as grade four, which is the same thing as glioblastoma. Juvenile pilocytic astrocytoma, relatively common tumor in children, and WHO grade one, but this particular tumor in the wrong location, for example, near the optic canal or supercellular system blocking off the third ventricle, these can be a huge problem. But nonetheless, it is considered grade one, and here's an example of a pilocytic showing you a nodule and a cyst, minimal degree of surrounding edema. This tumor's been there for a while because for a mass of this size to cause that minimal degree of edema suggests that it's been growing slowly. Nodule and a cyst. I showed you this earlier where you see a nodule and a cyst combination with a relatively minimal degree of mass effect and edema. Think about this more benign, slower-growing tumor, pilocytic astrocytoma, pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma, ganglioglioma. 
Hemangioblastomas can also have cysts in the nodule in the posterior fossa, but in my experience, hemangioblastoma tends to have much higher degree of edema, most likely due to the fact that they express vascular endothelial growth factor. But nonetheless, when you see cysts in the nodule, minimal edema, think of these three entities. But pilocytic is going to be one of your most common. Here is an example of a temporal lobe nodule and a cyst. Nodule and a cyst. This is a ganglioglioma. Here is a nodule and a cyst, virtually no edema. This is a pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma. PXA is also considered WHO grade one. They're usually biologically indolent, but there is an anaplastic variant that could actually behave a little bit more aggressively. Oligodendrogliomas, this is an interesting tumor because on imaging, they could look horrific. Huge, very large tumor. But what I want to point out about oligodendrogliomas is that these are usually cortically based tumor. So when you see a tumor that is expanding the overlying cortex, think about oligodendroglioma. Here's an, another example of a oligodendroglioma expanding the overlying cortex. Another example showing you the cortical expansion. The enhancement pattern could be very variable. So when you see this non-enhancing cortical expansile tumor, particularly in the frontal lobe, think about oligodendroglioma. Here's a point about MR underestimating calcification. Here's a gentleman presenting with a non-con CT showing you a thick calcified left frontal mass. And clearly there's something else deeper to that. Here is an MRI that was done a few days later. I really cannot see where that chunk of calcium is on this MR. So if you really wanted to check for the presence of calcium, use CT. Here's a gentleman with a oligodendroglioma, the lower grade component in the left frontal lobe, but this deep portion was anaplastic. Tumors with calcification, oligo is one of the common ones, but so is the ependymoma, craniopharyngioma, choroid plexus tumor, and we, we see meningiomas a lot more common than these combinations, so always think about meningioma as well. Let's move on to the primary tumor involving the brain covering. We already touched on um, meningioma, but ependymomas are interesting tumors because when they are supratentorial, they tend to be intraparenchymal. When they are infratentorial, they are intraventricular. And with this characteristic tongue of tissue going out through the fourth ventricular outflow tract. And this becomes a very helpful hint if you're trying to differentiate ependymoma versus medulloblastoma in the posterior fossa. So when you see a tongue of tumor tissue going out to the fourth ventricular outflow, think about ependymoma. Meningiomas, you've all seen this, very common, well-circumscribed tumor, characteristic angiographic appearance of early capillary and late venous phase. The most common location for an intraventricular meningioma is this meaning the atria of the lateral ventricle. Here's a two different patient. Here's a patient with a larger intraventricular meningioma in the atrium. Meningiomas on non-contrast CT or MR can be very difficult to outline because they tend to have a similar consistency as the brain. So here's a huge atrial meningioma that almost has a similar um, density as the adjacent brain. Here's the MR of the same patient, pre-GET T1, showing you fairly homogeneously isointense signal to the adjacent gray matter, very characteristic of meningioma. Upon giving contrast, avidly enhances. T2, same thing, very similar signal characteristic as the adjacent cortical gray matter. But they, almost all of them, avidly enhance. Now, not everything extraaxial is going to be meningioma, obviously. I'm showing you a four different examples of a extraaxial dural base metastases. Just because breast and lung are so much more common, you're gonna be running into these two histological subtypes the most common. Breast and lung, here's a patient with breast cancer metastases, here's a gentleman with a lung cancer and also a intraparenchymal component. Here's a prostate met that you could easily overlook if you're not really looking carefully. Prostate metastases tend to be dural based as opposed to being intraparenchymal. Neuroblastoma, same thing. These tend to be dural based as opposed to intraparenchymal. 
When you're looking at extraaxial tumor, all in the world looks like meningioma, but you don't really get the sense that this has a thick dural attachment as normally a meningioma would be. And also you see these very obvious vessels inside the tumor. Think about hemangiopericytoma. These are very vascular tumors. It used to be called angiogenic or angioplastic meningioma, but now they have a, their separate name. Here's an, another example of a hemangioblastoma. When you see this focal area of necrosis in an extraaxial tumor, it's very rare. This ha patient happens to be status post embolization, and that's why it looks like that there. This is the type of tumor that you may or may not see in your career. I've seen three so far, so maybe it's not that un unusual. Here's a lesion. You can literally cut it out with a scissor. No degree of edema. This tumor's been growing, uh, growing there for a while. This is a chondrosarcoma. Unlike other body parts chondrosarcoma, the intracranial chondrosarcomas usually do not have internal matrix. So calcium is not going to be a helpful hint. Another example, different patient, with a chondrosarcoma showing you virtually no edema, a dural attached tumor, Definitely does not look like meningioma or hemangioparasitoma. So if you're going down the differential of extraaxial mass, you've excluded meningioma, metastases, hemangioparasitoma. Back of your mind, think about chondrosarcoma. Brain metastases is going to be so much more common than any of these other tumors that I talked to you about because systemic cancer is so much more common. But the most helpful hint, in my opinion, is the post-GAT T1. When you see multiple enhancing masses, you've got to think about metastases. Here happens to be a leukemic metastases. Here's a patient with renal cell, two masses. Here's a case that I showed you earlier of a, young, a gentleman with a hemorrhagic lung metastases. And keep looking. We've now discovered several cases where we're so focused on the primary lesion Sometimes the second lesion can be easy to miss because you're so overwhelmed by, oh, look at that big Goomba, and then you're not carefully looking at other things. Not all multiple enhancing masses are metastases. So let me show you some example. Here is a young man, diabetic, two masses of the brain. Diffusion is incredibly helpful. When you see this kind of a true, true reduced diffusion, think about a pyogenic abscess. Here's a gentleman I also showed you before, ring enhancing mass, there's one and there's two. So metastases should be on your high on your differential. He also had back pain. And you could see the epidural component. This is actually a gentleman with tuberculosis. Cerebral lymphoma is a very interesting tumor. Nobody can figure out why lymphoma incidence is increasing, but nonetheless, incidence of lymphoma in immunocompetent patient is slowly rising. One of the caveats about lymphoma is that it tends to involve where glioblastomas can involve. For example, corpus callosum is not an uncommon location, but usually the T2 signal characteristic can be helpful. Usually, lymphomas tend to have a fairly homogeneously low signal intensity on T2, and they tend to have mildly reduced diffusion. Look at this case. This was called glioblastoma, but I'm gonna show you Whenever you see a parenchymal mass in association with a dural component, glioblastomas almost never present initially as a dural-based mass. So whenever you see this combination of parenchymal and dural involvement, think about metastases, think about lymphoma. And this is a lymphoma. Another example of multiple enhancing masses of the brain. Initially, this was called demyelinating disease, but this is actually B-cell lymphoma, a mimicker of all things. And also, these tumors can be exquisitely sensitive to steroids. And in our experience, we actually have seen lymphomas almost completely disappear after two weeks of intense steroid therapy. No other tumor will do that. So when you see a lesion that completely disappears, Think lymphoma, obviously think demyelinating lesion as well. So tumors with low T2 signal, I touched upon this before, but any kind of high cellular tumor would do this. Lymphoma, medulloblastoma, pineoblastoma, some meningiomas, and also mucinous type of tumors. The neuronal tumor I showed, 
spoke to you earlier, it's not that common, but nonetheless, I want to show you two examples of a neuronal tumor that you may run into in real life. Here's a tumor that has attachment to the septum pellucidum, intraventricular mass, enhances. This is virtually diagnostic of a central neurocytoma. Here's a companion case, another tumor that has septal attachment, but look at the post-GAT imaging, does not enhance. This is subependymoma. When a tumor does not enhance and it's sept based to the septum, unlikely that's going to be central neurocytoma. So who cares whether it's subependymoma or central neurocytoma, they're all coming out. Not true, because in neuro central neurocytoma, these are incredibly vascular tumor. We've had recent case of patient bleeding out two to three liters of blood because these are incredibly hemorrhagic. So surgeons need to know before they go in whether it's subependymoma or central neurocytoma, and the biggest clue will be post-GAT T1 imaging, and if you're doing perfusion MRI at your centers, that will be another very helpful test to do. Intraventricular mass that has attachment to the septum, think about central neurocytoma and subependymoma. Pediatric brain tumors, I've shown you ependymoma that had a tongue of tissue going out into the fourth ventricular uh, outflow. Here is a medulloblastoma. Medulloblastomas do not go out into the fourth ventricular outflow tract. And also, medullo, unlike ependymoma, tend to spread by CSF early on. When you see a dominant posterior fossa mass in association with these multiple CSF metastases, medulloblastoma, medulloblastoma. Here is a patient with PNET, primitive neuroectodermal tumor. I showed you of a, earlier in the CT showing you the obstructive hydrocephalus. Here is this very large, bizarre tumor. CSF dissemination, what are the tumor types that like to do that? PNET, medulloblastoma, pineoblastoma, ependymoma, and also we've seen with choroid plexus tumors. Here's an example of choroid plexus papilloma. Here's an example of a choroid plexus carcinoma. So these are intraventricular tumors. Craniopharyngioma in children is relatively common, but these tend to be multicystic mass. If you wanted to confirm the presence of calcium, which can be helpful differentiating this from other type, you could always get CT. But in my experience, sometimes CT does not show you calcium very well because the calcium tends to form around the rim and the rim is really thin, it may not catch it. So these multicystic appearance centered in the supracellular cistern in a young patient, you should think about craniopharyngioma. Here is a post-GAD imaging of that patient showing you a thin rim of enhancement. Diffusion positive mass. I told you about how diffusion weighted imaging can be incredibly helpful. Commit to memory some of these tumors or lesions that are diffusion positive. Epidermoid, mucinous adnomet, abscess, particularly the pyogenic variety, but also some cellular tumors as well. Here is a classic epidermoid showing you lesion extraaxial follow CSF signal, does not enhance, but markedly reduced, diagnostic of epidermoid. Here's another example of an extraaxial middle fossa mass, completely reduced, this is epidermoid. Here's a mucinous adenocarcinoma metastases that have a markedly reduced diffusion. Tumor mimicking lesions, temporal lobe, enhancing mass, think about radiation necrosis. Patient with history of nasopharyngeal carcinoma or patient with history of chordoma, think about radiation necrosis, particularly in the bitemporal lobe mass with enhancement pattern that looks like glioblastoma but it would be very unusual to have glioblastoma in bitemporal lobes. And we've seen quite a few uh, bitemporal radiation necrosis in patients who receive a wide external beam radiation, for example, for chordoma. And perfusion, if you do it at your centers, these are non-vascular lesions. Another example of a radiation necrosis that can look just like glioblastoma. This is a woman with a remote history of external beam radiation therapy for a left eyelid squamous cell carcinoma. Elicit that history if something does not make sense. Here, we elicited that history because the patient's perfusion MRI didn't show any vascularity. So that was our first clue that maybe that's not glioblastoma, even though it looks very aggressive. This is a case from three weeks ago at UCSF. We all thought this was tumor. Look how huge it is. 
incredibly large mass, but this turned out to be what was bo bothersome was that on perfusion MRI was flat. There was no abnormal vascularity. This is a resection proven tumefactive demyelinating lesion. Always, always think of this entity in the back of your mind. Reduced mass pyogenic abscess. Here's a butterfly glioma. Not. This patient, this patient actually went bifrontal lobectomy for this lesion. It was toxo, and HIV disease was diagnosed after craniotomy. This is uh, my case from New York. So this is not what you want. Let's do the five cases. Here's an 18-year-old guy, multiple masses intraventricularly, but one point I want to make out is on pre-GAD imaging, look at these little high signal area in the sulcus. This is a guy with a dermoid that has ruptured, and this is actually a lipid CSF level. And the way to prove it is here's actually, you can see nice chemical shift artifact. And actually, this is a fat saturated imaging showing you that that bright thing sats out. So fat saturation technique is a good thing to use if you're suspecting a lipid-containing lesion. So this is a ruptured dermoid. And here's a CT showing you, I don't know, it's like a rudimentary tooth or something. Whenever you see an extra axial mass and you're about to give a diagnosis of meningioma, look at how dark this mass is on T2, almost black. When you see a black lesion on T2, think about a fibrous lesion. This is a solitary fibrous tumor, well characterized WHO tumor. So whenever you see a dark T2 lesion mass that all in the world looks like meningioma, think about solitary fibrous tumor. Here's a mass, left right frontal lobe. But this is the key. Diffusion and ADC showing you markedly reduced lesion, pyogenic abscess. Think about pyogenic abscess. So diffusion is very, very helpful. Here's an extra axial mass. Markedly reduced, this is epidermoid, classic. Now, these three patients with these masses, kind of incomplete rim enhancement, little bit of edema, minimal mass effect. Here's patient one, here's patient two, some bizarre looking enhancement here. Here's another patient, relatively large mass, some edema, but minimal mass effect. Three patients all went to surgery for presumed aggressive high-grade glioma, turned out to have demyelinating lesion. These lesions should not be going to the surgery. If they're going to surgery at all, it should be limited biopsy. Think about TDL, tumor effective demyelinating lesions.